Welcome to Hope Refreshed. I'm Pastor Jeff Burkhardt, and we welcome you and thank you for joining us today. I have a very special guest in studio with me today, Van Clow. Welcome, Van. Hey, Pastor. How are you doing? Van is a great man of God, studier of the Word of God. He spends lots of time studying the Word. He and I just love to talk about Scripture, and uh, we enjoy that quite a bit. But Van is also a radio station engineer, owns his own engineering company, and uh, God has has blessed him, but it didn't start there, did it, Van? No, not at all. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, you had shared your testimony with with me, and I'd ask you to come in and share it because I think it's going to be a blessing uh, to those who are watching today, to every person who's watching. And so um, take me back to your school days and share with me how it all started. Well, before I was born again, I was actually in the... They call it special ed, and I think they call it a different, they got a different name for it today. Uh, But uh, for the longest, uh, up until the age of 16 is when I got born again. And then I got out of that class uh, within two weeks of being born again. Wow. Now, the grade structure is a little different um, than... Uh, here, <laughs> I got away with a lot, but I thought a D was awesome. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, and then uh, God through teachers and stuff helped me. Uh, and so, uh, out of high school, um, I had a band director who was born again, and I always wanted to become a band director because of him. And he's just a great inspiration in my life. Right. And then he, uh, um, and then after I uh, left high school, a friend of mine who was at a radio station, um, called me, and he wanted me to come over for some reason. I'm not sure what it was, to pick up something. We were kind of neighbors. And I said, yeah, I'll stop by. So as soon as I walked in the radio station, I saw what he was doing. I saw the equipment and everything like that. That idea of band director went, boom, it was gone. <laughs> I knew that was a hook right then. So I started as a radio announcer, and uh, up, uh, up until... Uh, probably about 10 years as a radio announcer. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't have, uh, I found out fast I couldn't afford to be a star. But Because yeah. uh, radio announcers, unless you're like mornings or afternoons or program, programming, they just don't make a lot of money. At yeah, all. been there. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and so, I mean, you survive on remotes, on pizza, and yeah. stuff like that. And uh, just, you know, but uh, there was an engineer in West Virginia and uh, um, he's a mountain guy. Uh, I don't know if he's saved or not. I don't think he was. But uh, anyway, every time the transmitter or a piece of equipment would blow up, I'd be right next to him. And he turned around and looked at me. He says, you need to be doing this. And since uh, I was, I didn't ever thought I could because I was terrible at math. Um, like I barely passed or graduated, but I did. And I was only... Out of all my siblings, uh, out of four, I was the only one that did. Now, wow. my two sisters went out by, and got their uh, uh, GED, but um, but I, I'm the one that graduated. So so when he would say that to you, what was your reaction to that? Uh, I was like, you know, well, I, I, I dismissed it in yeah. a way. And, and so, but I think that's when the seed was planted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so uh, I moved from West Virginia. That's a whole different broadcast there, uh, that story, West Virginia. And I went to Florida, and um, I just decided, like, hey, I want to try this electronics thing. Well, I couldn't do the math. And so the um, the, pers- the recruiter of the electronics, he actually took time out for me and tutored me in math. And then I got um, into another math class uh, that basically taught the basics, algebra, trigonometry, and everything, stuff I don't even use today, but but it's needed for electronics course. So uh, I got into a two years associates and, uh, in Tampa, Florida, and they're the only ones. Um, there was two schools. There was one in Quincy, Illinois, and then there was one in um, Tampa, Florida, the one I was going to, that taught what they call RF, or tube theory. Uh, radio stations... Uh, still today, use uh, their, a lot of the transmitters use a tube, mm-hmm. and and they're uh, for their final uh, for power. So, uh, 
Uh, but anyway, I graduated that, and my, my first uh, job was in Statesville, North Carolina. That's how I got to the Carolinas Wow, from Florida. Now, how many, how many years was it that you were alongside that engineer and he was telling you you ought to be doing this? Uh, probably about five. Wow. Probably like five years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, you were sharing that with me in your testimony about how every time he would come and show up and you're there shadowing him or handing him a screwdriver or whatever, he kept just saying that over and over. Yeah, I don't know if I annoyed him or whatever, but he... <laughs> He uh, um, he just said, you know, you need to be doing this, and I was like, eh. and so I, like I said, I think that's when the seed was planted. Yeah, yeah, you know. So his name is Marvin. Marvin. <laughs> Marvin. Yeah, Marvin the Martian. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, Van, um, you know, you moved from there to Florida, and you went in the school, and then there you ran into this uh, recruiter. Um, who also took time to just bring you along and encourage you. Yeah. Um, and, and do you remember his name? Do you remember what that guy's no, name was? No, I don't. I, I really don't. He was he was a sweetheart, but I just I don't remember the name. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. I, hey, I, I'm with you, man. I yeah. forget. I can forget a name. What What's the old saying that uh, a friend of mine used to say? He said, uh, "I can never remember a name, but I can always forget a face." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, so, it, you know, along that path to you getting your first job in, in radio, um, you had these two guys, Marvin, the Martian, yeah. and, uh, and then this recruiter who just took time to kind of help you and prod you along and say, you can do this. And, you know, sometimes that happens. And when someone says that to us, um, it seems foreign because, uh, you know, you're... Uh, where you were, you were thinking, I, I could never do that. I yeah. can't pass the math. Yeah. I can't do that. I just barely graduated high school, um, you know. And yeah, and, I, I actually had a thought, and it's a lie. Uh, I know it was a lie. I didn't know then, but I, I, I thought because of the classes, special classes I was in, I never measured up. I wasn't as smart as other people, and that was a limiter. And I didn't know that. And uh, what uh, I had a. Um, do you know who Phil Drisco is? Phil Drisco is a trumpet player. Oh, yeah, Phil Drisco. Yeah. Okay, so he came to... When I was with the radio station, yeah. I emceed a couple of his concerts. Wow. <laughs> when, so you know who in. he is. So yeah. anyway, he uh, he came to Why Mama, Florida. I mean, what a name, but it's <laughs> it's out of Tampa. Don't ask me to spell it, but it's Why Mama. I don't I don't think it's the letter, you know, it's Y and then Mama. I think it's, <laughs> it's all one word. And I think it's an Indian name. But... Um, Anyway, the, uh, uh, someone invited me to the service, and he was, he was late. He was his own pilot, so he was late because of weather or something like that. And I'm telling you this, even to this day, uh, it was so charged. The atmosphere was so charged. Uh, like it talked about in the priest, they couldn't minister because of the presence of God was so right. strong. That actually happened. I saw the pastor get up, and he tried to read Scripture, and he couldn't. It's just like people are just like hanging off the light fixtures. But something that night broke in me, and I can't even tell you what it was. Uh, but I, I think what happened, because I remember a um, woman lived uh, another home in Hope Mills, and I can tell you exactly where I was. I was uh, coming up uh, Rockfish Road. Uh, There's a veterinary in the hospital right on Rockfish Road. Mm -hmm. And Immediately, I said, I'm not stupid. I'm not dumb. That's, it was, I was delivered of it. It was just like gone. I just, I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a stupid person. And I was just, wow. That was like, the time is like four or five years later. Right. But I think that seed was planted at that time. In that meeting. In that meeting yeah. there. Because, wow. you know, someone laid hands on me and I just, you know, in the presence of God, no one laid hands on me actually. Um, it was just the, just the atmosphere was just so charged. Right. And people were just getting free. And, I mean, I'll just never forget that experience. Wow. And, uh, but I, I think that's what happened. And so shortly thereafter, that experience, I had this thought. Like, you, and I was working for somebody here in uh, Fayetteville. And uh, as an employee, making eighteen five a year. A year, me. yeah. And my wife was working for Quincy. She was a... Uh, uh, restaurant manager Quincy Steakhouse remember that one? Oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the East Roll but uh, <laughs> the East Rolls were the best yeah, which, yeah. I, I still carry a few of those I think <laughs> <laughs> which uh, 
Logan's actually bought their recipe yet. Um, yeah. So you, when you eat a Logan's r- r- roll, you're eating the actual yeast you're roll. You're eating the Quincy's, yeah. Quincy yeast roll. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, she, um, uh, I had this uh, thought, and I said, you know, I should go in business for myself. Well, I like, I thought of it that. That's stupid, you know. <laughs> That's dumb. And uh, so it was a year later. And I, again, I tell you exactly where it was. I was at the post office, and all of a sudden, like this dread came on me, and I, I felt like I was going to fail financially. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm tithing, you know, and everything. And then I finally asked the Lord, I said, "What? What, what is this? I feel it's like a fear." And He said, "Didn't I tell you a year ago to go in business for yourself?" I said, that was you. <laughs> I thought that was just an idea. A still small voice. A still right? small voice. So yeah. I said, I don't know how to do this. And so I, you know, uh, long story short, I got into, uh, uh, got a charter. I got in, uh, somebody that knew, knew about business. So I incorporated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so the the, all my cl- all my employees, employer, excuse me, became my clients. And wow! This switched over. It's like the transition was so smooth that all my fellow uh, co-workers, they didn't know the change. They thought I was still an employee of the company, and and so, so the first year uh, was 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 great, except for the tax year we got, uh, and the it was a tax disaster. One of many, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's how I started uh, with the engineering side. Wow, yeah. Now it's amazing to me because you know when I when I have talked to people about you, um, um, you know, and I do IT, um, you know, some, and and I, I've been a tech geek for a, a long time. But when I talk to people about you who know my background, I say Van's one of those guys that he can start talking about something technical and I just smile and nod and pretend I understand what he's talking about. Um, you know, um, and I worked at the Christian radio station where you do the engineering for a little yes. while here uh, in Fayetteville. And, um, and you know, I look at you as one of the smartest guys I know. And yet, behind the scenes, here you are struggling with this oppression of the enemy telling you you're not smart, you're dumb, even stupid is the word yeah, you used. Yeah. And, uh, and you're carrying the weight of that. Um, and yet the Spirit of God began to work to break that off of you. And then all of a sudden you had that epiphany moment where it just all came to fruition and you said, no, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't seeking it. I, was, I think I was even listening to the radio. It's in a little Zuzu pickup truck. And I was cresting the hill. As I can see it in my mind just playing. And that was many years ago. I was like... 20 years ago, uh, maybe even longer. And I just knew it's like something set free, just boom, the weight was lifted off. And I was just, hey, you know, I'm, I'm actually a pretty smart guy. You know? <laughs> <You're very laughs> so, yeah. And that was the spirit of God. And I, like I said, I believe this, that seed was planted in that service. That's because I can't tell you what I got free of and why I'm on Florida in that service. But I just knew something broke. Yeah, and I think different. that's what it was. Yeah. You know. Um, so what do you see in the Word of God that was there before you knew it that was telling you that you were not less than, that you are um, indeed the creation of God? And, and you know, what, what would you share with someone else who might be struggling with that that you know now? Well, that I know now is, yeah, it was a, looking back on it and reading the Word of God and spending time in the Word that the greatest uh, uh, weapon that the enemy has, the only weapon actually he has, is deception. And uh, he gets us, we're all born in deception, all. There's, there's not a person uh, that is not born in deception. Um, and so immediately the enemy starts trying to program you through, pe- uh, especially authority of figures, speaking over your kids and, and uh, teachers. You know, uh, for instance, uh, our son, uh, he was going to, I'm not going to mention the school because I don't want it to, just in case this person, the teacher, hears it, but she was calling him names and stuff. And 
my wife and I was just like, uh-uh, this is not happening, because he looked at her as an authority figure. Right. And, uh, of course, being, a, being the parents, our word carries greater authority. Right. So those of you who have, you know, kids um, that just remember that your authority over your own children is much greater, is the greatest right. over. But um, it just came through seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is, is how, you know, learning who you are in Christ. Right. And, that, and that's basically in a nutshell, which is, you know, kind of a, at that time when I crest the hill, I wasn't, yeah, I was a Christian believer. I went to church, I died, um, you know, and participated in, in church service. But my, um, my time in the Word then was only Sundays and Wednesdays. Right. And occasionally I'd get a tape, cassette tape series, <laughs> like yeah. from Kenneth Copeland or from, uh, uh, you know, Speakers of the day, uh, and just listen to them like uh, Keith Hardy lo- loves um, uh, Kenneth Hagen. Kenneth Hagen, yeah. Kenneth Hagen yeah. yeah, and that was his hero. So, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so I just, you know, I was I was feeding on somebody else's revelation. It wasn't my own. Wow. It was it was, it was still the Word of God, but it wasn't my own revelation. And matter of fact, talking about your own revelation, it's so important to be in the Word of God. Uh, I, when I started my reading through the Bible, the year program, mm-hmm. I would always skip Job, always. And the Lord stopped me one day and says, why are you skipping Job? I said, well, you know, you have three idiot friends that come out. And I mean, you know, and I just don't like it because I was always told, it's preached from the pulpit that, you know, that God is the one responsible for that, even that he showed the devil was in the background yeah. doing this. But... You know, nothing happens unless God allows it, you know. Yeah. And the way it was portrayed, and so I said, God, I, I just don't believe that of you. I don't believe that you would do that to somebody. I couldn't do that to my, to even think to do that to one of my own children would, is so foreign from me. And it says that we get the signitude of our fatherhood from you. So that can't come from you. But anyway, it wasn't until we were, uh, I got to chapter 42, I read it. And I read it out of the uh, message translation in the, the very end. And this is when God was questioning Job, and he was done. God was done, and then Job says, I see it now. I see it all for myself. I see it now. He said, I heard from others, but now I see it for myself. And boy, it was like a revelation for me that he was living off secondhand information. Wow. They said he was a contemporary around Abraham's time because the, 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 the fourth person that showed up that God didn't rebuke was a Buzzite. And that was in the, uh, Abraham's lineage. Uh, right. uh, I think it was his uncle or great uncle um, uh, on that. But so that's how probably Job knew about the sacrifices. Wow. And everything like that, because Abraham did. So they were like a contemporary, even though Job is supposed to be the oldest book in the Bible. But uh, when he says, when I see, Job was living off secondhand information. Pastor Jeff said this. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> you know, what does God say? You know, yeah. I mean, I'd say that your word is not important because you know, pastoral and other people are important, but right. it's your revelation right. that, you know, we're living off, or somebody else's revelation, or Kenneth Copeland, or Joyce Meyer, or whoever your favorite teacher is. If you're living off their revelation, well, Joyce Meyer said this, or my pastor said this. No, what do you say about yeah. this? That's yeah. the thing. What does God say about yeah. this? Yeah. Well, remember Paul? And yeah. Remember the, the uh, what was it, the seven sons of Sceva, or whatever, mm-hmm. jumped on him? They said, well, Paul, we know. Jesus, we know. Who are you? Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't their own revelation. Right, right. And that's why the devil just beat up on him. Right. You know, and it wasn't Job's revelation. You know, what you are saying right now, Van, is really a revelatory word because what you're talking about is knowing what God is speaking. Uh, Jesus prayed for us in John 17 and said, Sanctify them through thy Uh, sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. And so the word of God is truth. 
And yet what you had been struggling with for so long was deception. Yeah. And just as God is, the scripture says that God is not a man, that he can lie. Um, and we know that that's because of the creative power of God's voice. Whatever God says becomes, so there's, it's impossible for him to lie. If he said the sky was purple, the sky would turn purple because exactly. of his creative power. So he cannot lie. Uh, on the flip side of that, the Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. Now, why did the Word of God use that term, father? Um, well, we know from biology that the um, that that whether or not you have a son or daughter is not from the mother's genes; it's from the father's genes. It's uh, the the mother only makes female chromosomes; the father makes male and female chromosomes, and you know, and so depending on uh, how that's matched up depends on whether you have a son or a daughter. Um, so there is truth and there is deception, but Satan can only produce one. He yeah. can't produce both. Yeah. He can. That's why the scripture said he's the father of lies. The only thing he can reproduce is a lie. And so if you go all the way back to the beginning, you said, you said something that jumped out at me earlier. You said all of us are born in deception. You didn't say all of us were born in sin. And when you said that, I was like, man, something just jumped up in my spirit because where does sin take its root? Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Deception. Deception. Hath God surely said? Did yeah. God really say that? Yeah. Do you sure he didn't mean this? Yeah. And so the first sin and every other sin since then has its root in two things, deception and selfishness. Um, we want to please ourselves, so we believe the lie instead of the truth. And, uh, and, and so here you have people all around us, maybe you watching today, and these lies from the enemy have bombarded your mind like they did Van to the point that he didn't think it was possible for him to do what uh, he was really interested in doing. But the, the Lord sent a couple of people along. First there was Marvin, then there was the, the guy who was the recruiter for the college who said, you can do this, yeah. you can do this, you can do this. And they kept encouraging him until he tried it. And then, uh, but even after you did it and you were working in the industry, you still had that deception yes. that you were carrying around. And you, even though you had the knowledge and you had gone through the schooling, you still in the back of your mind didn't think you were there yeah. until the Spirit of God one day revealed to you, wait a minute, you're not who the enemy says you are. You are who I say you are. And uh, wow, what a powerful, powerful revelation. And so for you today, you've been listening to this testimony and it's resonated in your heart. And you can hear if you mash the button on that cassette tape van uh, <laughs> that we all have in our head, yeah. uh, if you pa mash the play button on that uh, cassette tape, you can hear the recordings of words that have been spoken over you that you're not smart enough, good enough, pretty enough, <laughs> tall enough, this or that enough. You, you are less than in some way because of the words of others that have uh, spoken to you. Or maybe because just those words that you hear in your head, the lie of the enemy, that you're never going to be good enough. And yet the Lord says, you are good enough. Why? Because he made you. And the, the Bible tells us that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. What happens when we repent, man? We say we're sorry, right? Yeah. So when the word of God says that our gifts, which means what he put in us, what he gave us, are without repentance, that means God never looked at Van Clough and said, I'm sorry I made him that way. Oh. Yeah. He never looks at you and says, I'm sorry I made you that way. God will never change his mind for the way he made you because he made you exactly like you needed to be. And I just want to encourage you today to get into the Word of God and to go to Him right now and just say, God, I've been carrying around all these lies all these years. Lord, just like you did for Van, will you let your Holy Spirit break the hold of that uh, over my life? Um, you know, the Bible tells us that the anointing breaks the yoke. And we believe that the Spirit of God can break that off of your life. And I'm going to ask you to pray for the one watching today who's struggling uh, with those lies of the enemy, that God would just break them free. Yeah.
Oh, God, thank you in Jesus' name for this time and uh, for the technology here and for this church. But, Father, it's just like you have, you, 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 you are, I'm your favorite. We're all favorites of you. If we're in, you're in Christ, you're his favorite. And, Father, just like you have me, that this power of deception, I just call it broken over the person that's struggling. Yes. Maybe they feel that they're, you know, less than or not smart or, or you know, they look in the mirror and they say, I'm not pretty or I'm not, you know, I've got flaws or whatever. But and, and they amplify that. But, Father, this is who you, you say who we are in Christ. That, Father, that give them a revelation of who they are in Christ. That they're not a mistake. They're not a dud. <laughs> that they were created with purpose, worth, and value. And that, Father God, that no matter even those are thinking right now, I'm hearing this, that it's too late. Uh, I, I can't. Uh, just, it's too late for me. I'm too old or, or just, you know, my course is set. No, it's not. That, that Again, that's a lie because God is the only one who can redeem time. Nobody else yes. can redeem time except for him. So what he wants you to do, pick up your Bible, repent, say, hey, those thoughts are wrong. I, I, you know, I take them captive in the obedience of Christ right now, lay them at his feet. And, Father, I just, you know, show me, open my eyes to my, my purpose that you have for me, bring in the people that I need to, to help facilitate the calling and purpose that you have in my life, the church yes, I need Jesus. to be in, or who I need to be listening to. That's important, too. And, uh, and, that, and, just, and you have a great... A great, great destiny. God has not, like Pastor said, has not changed his mind. He will not change his mind about you. He can't change his mind about you. But it's up to you. And the step is, I pray that you take, just take that step of faith. And that a journey of a thousand miles starts with one, one step. And I thank you for encouraging. and send also encouragement and also in Jesus' name. So, amen. Amen. Man, thank you so much, man, for sharing your story. Amen. I believe it's going to be an encouragement to many, many people who uh, are just bombarded with those lies of the enemy. We Amen. all deal with that all the time. Yeah. The enemy doesn't uh, let up. But you know what? We have been given a weapon to defend ourselves, two of them actually, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit. Yeah. And so and by believing what the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God says, we can ward off these attacks of the enemy. That's right. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us on Hope Refreshed, and we'll see you next time.